Hello, good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Eric Bricker with A Healthcare Z. Thank you so much for joining. And today's topic is the secrets of self funding. So, as always, let's start with an audio video. video audio video check. So if you're on LinkedIn or YouTube, if you could leave a uh, comment to let me know if you can see and hear me, okay, that would be fantastic. And also during the course of this presentation, if you have questions or comments, please leave them in the questions or comments section of LinkedIn or YouTube, and I can see them on my end, and then I will answer them through the presentation. And uh, if I don't get to them, then I will answer them in writing afterwards. So I um, want to check here. Okay. You are confirming that you can see and hear me. Okay. Fantastic. So the secrets of self-funding, let's get into it. Now, of course, many of you know me, but for those of you who don't, I'm Dr. Eric Bricker. I'm an internist. Before I went to medical school, I actually used to be a hospital finance consultant. So I worked in the billing and business office of major medical centers back in the late 90s. And then I went on to medical school at the University of Illinois and then did my internal medicine residency at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore and um, then went on to practice as a hospitalist physician at a Baylor hospital system uh, facility in Plano, Texas, which is a suburb of Dallas. And I actually was also... Um, at the same time, the co-founder of a healthcare navigation firm called Compass Professional Health Services, where we had employers as customers, and we would help their employees and their family members navigate their health insurance and their health care benefits. And we did that for over 1.8 million people across 2,000 employer clients, big names like uh, Southwest Airlines and T-Mobile, but a whole bunch of mid-market groups like 200 to 2,000. And we did gobs of small groups as well, uh, literally from manufacturing to municipalities, to universities, to software companies, to law firms and everything in between. It's a fantastic experience. And I was a sales and marketing guy a lot of the time. I was out there meeting with employers. It was uh, 11 years of, uh, of just awesomeness. I just had so much fun uh, meeting with all the employers and the employees. Uh, we were acquired by Light Solutions in 2018, which is a benefit administration platform. Uh, and then I started making these A Healthcare Z uh, videos, which many of you watch. So thank you for doing that on both YouTube and LinkedIn. And then lastly, I'm the medical director for Simple Pay Health, which is an alternative health plan. Now I would just say, if you uh, like this content, if you could give it a thumbs up on whatever platform you are on, that would be super helpful if I can ask you for one favor. Now, let's get into the weeds on self-funding. Now, this data on this slide comes from the Employee Benefits Research Institute. You may be familiar with these folks. They've got great information. Now, let's look at self-funding trends over time. Yes, the percent of self-funded employers has been rising from 1999 to 2016. In 1999, 27% of employers in America were self-funded. And then as of 2016, it was 41%. But interestingly, that basically steady increase in self-funding has plateaued for the last five plus years. So it has essentially stayed on, it's, it's gone up and down a little bit, but it has essentially stayed unchanged from 2016 to today, now in 2023. Okay, now, but we can't just look at averages. One of the themes that we're gonna talk about today is, is that when you talk about the nation as a whole on average, it's like talking about the average temperature in America, which is not very uh, relevant to you where you are, because whether you're in Maine or Southern California, the temperature could be totally different. So the average nationally, is, is not necessarily the most relevant number. So we're gonna, we're gonna have to break it down. So let's break it down by employer size. So larger employers tend to be self-funded. So for employers that have 500 employees or more, 75% of them are self-funded. So the vast majority of quote unquote larger employers are self-funded. And if you go above a thousand or 10,000, it's even more than that, right? Because um, it's almost unheard of for very large groups to be fully insured. The vast majority of them are self-funded. Okay, next. For groups 100 to 499 employees, 32% are self-funded. So you see it drops off a lot here, 
between over 500 and then 100 to 499. And then for under 100, the vast majority, uh, or I should say the vast minority of employers under 100, which is typically considered small group, are self-funded. Only 16% of small groups are self-funded. So you go from 75 down to 32 down to 16. Now I'm going to make this bigger so that we can see it all okay. Now let's work look at the percentage of workers on self-funded plans, right? So if we said that the, the, the percentage of employers maxed out at uh, 41%, rather the percentage of workers on self-funded plans rose from 1999 to 2016 from 41% to 60%, right? So back in 1999, even though you had a smaller percentage of employers that were self-funded, you had a much larger number of workers that were on self-funded plans. And why is that? Because it was the larger companies that were self-funded. And then likewise, even to this day, even though less than half of employers are on self-funded plans, more than half of employees are on a self-funded plan. Again, because it's the larger employers that have self-funded um, uh, health insurance. Okay, So it's important to understand the stratification. Anytime you break things down into smaller subsets, it is referred to as stratification. So it's, under, it's important to understand the stratification of self-funding by employer size, and then also the trend over time. And I would say that a possible reason for why self-funding has plateaued between 2016 and now, to a certain extent, is employer complacency, right? Because what has happened between 2016 and now is we have had tremendous economic growth and corporate profits have been at record highs and unemployment has been low. And so we have had employers who've been really flush with cash. And so what is the main impetus for self-funding is that it saves money. Well, if your company is flush with cash and it's growing its top line and it's growing its bottom line, then you're not necessarily paying attention to being astute in uh, cost cutting within your organization. And so isn't it interesting that we have had a real plateau in self-funding from 2016 to today. Now, to the extent that we are entering, entering into a potential recession in the near future, we will see if the decreased revenue and decreased profits of businesses actually causes them to look back onto their employee health plan and be like, ah, being fully insured is super expensive. Maybe we should be self-funded. So we shall see. Okay, next up, let's look at it geographically. All right, now, we have a, a map of the United States, obviously. Now, the green, the dark green areas are higher concentrations of self-funding. And the lighter orange areas are the lower areas of self-funding. And then you got the yellow in between. So you can see between North Carolina, Virginia, Kentucky, West Virginia, Ohio and Indiana. I'm going to call that self-funding alley. That's self-funding alley in America. Look how this area of America has a higher percentage of self-funded employers. Now, let's look at places that have low self-funding. So California, obviously the big behemoth, because it's the most populous state in America, is a very low concentration of self-funding. Arizona, low concentration of self-funding. Nevada, low concentration of self-funding. Let's also look at the lighter yellow areas as well. So we talked about, I talked about in a previous A Healthcare Z video about how the Northeast tends to have lower levels of self-funding. And you can see for very populous states like New Jersey and Massachusetts, they're small in geographic size, but they have tons of people. Um, it's, de it's deceiving, right? Because if New Jersey and Massachusetts, if the size of their state was comparable to the number of people that live there, they would be some of the largest states in America, right? So gobs of people live in Massachusetts and New Jersey, okay? Very large. Light. Maryland also has a very high population. It's a small state. It's where I'm from originally, but it actually has a lot of people uh, because it has the Washington, D.C., Baltimore area. Okay. Now, also, New York is also lighter as well. Okay. So, in general, the Northeast is fairly low. And then when you look across the South and the Midwest, 
um, you can see that outside of self-funding alley here, you have areas like Texas and Missouri and Arkansas and Alabama and some of these other southern states that have fairly high levels of self-funding. So it's important to know that there is a geographic difference in terms of the distribution of self-funding in America as well. And now we're going to go into the weeds on that. Okay, so now this is a busy chart, but I'm going to go through it slowly because there's a lot of great information in here. Okay, so here we have the entire United States and the total employer self-funding rate, which here is about 58%. So it wasn't the exact same year as before. And then it breaks it down by companies with 100 to 1,000 employees and companies with over 1,000 employees. And so as you can see for the entire United States, the self-funding rate is 42% for 100 to 1,000, and it's 77% for over 1,000. Now let's look at it by specific state, and it breaks it down by geographic regions. Now, you can see in general that the green for the employers over 1,000, it's pretty consistent, right? In most states, employers over 1,000 are, have the majority self-funded. But you can see that there's a high degree of variability here for the, the mid-market employers, 100 to 1,000. And I would tell you that is where I see the biggest discrepancy for employers that want to be more cost conscious and efficient with the uh, financial structure and the funding structure of their self-funded plans because self-funded plans are, are cheaper. Um, and they're, I mean, they're less expensive without compromising quality. And one would say that a state that is more aggressive in its self-funding between 100 and 99 and other mid-market employers is sort of more focused or concerned about the financial performance of their employee health plan, whereas employers that have lower levels of self-funding in that age tend to be less focused on it. And I would say that there is a push and a pull dynamic there around self-funding for mid-market employers. What do I mean by that? There is a push for self-funding in that the employer themselves might be more interested in self-funded. What would be a push? The push would be if it is a relatively low margin business because low margin. So like the classic example of that is grocery stores, right? So of course, grocery stores are going to be self-funded because their margins are only like three or 4%. They're super slim. And so low margin businesses are going to be very focused on cutting costs because they don't they don't make a lot of margin to begin with whereas high margin businesses like software tend to be not as self-funded because they're just making gobs of money and so they're not necessarily paying as much attention to the cost cutting um mechanisms within their organization now um so that's that's the push that's the push by the employer and then there's the pull okay and the pull is that Health insurance carriers do not want you to be self-funded. So they make more money when you are fully insured, especially in the mid-market. And we're going to talk about that on this later slide. So just know that part of the dynamic for why these mid-market employers are not self-funded in their states is, is there something that the health insurance carriers in their states are doing to particularly encourage being fully insured and particularly discouraging being self-funded? Okay, now let's break down the states. So you can see here that Massachusetts, and I circled uh, certain states to pull them out. So you can see here that Massachusetts at 35% is well below the national average of 42% for mid-market self-funded employers. Likewise, New York at 29% is also well below the national average for self-funding for mid-market employers. New Jersey is also super low as well at 27%, but there's an asterisk here that actually says that it, the data might not be reliable. So let's just not count New Jersey here, okay? Next, of course, we talked about California on the previous map. So you can see that California has a mid-market self-funding rate of 31% versus the national average of 42%. Okay, so here you have very populous states of Massachusetts, New York, and California that have 
relatively low rates of self-funding. Isn't that interesting? What do you have in Massachusetts, New York, and California? You have very high margin businesses. The cottage industry of New York City is finance, where the margins are super high. The cottage industry of California is software technology and entertainment, where the margins are super high. In Massachusetts, Again, you have lots of software and technology and biotech companies where the margins are super high. So you have a lot of employers who are making so much money that, frankly, they are not paying as much attention to being as cost effective with their health plan as other parts of the country. Okay, now I underlined states that have particularly high levels of self-funding for mid-market employers. Interesting there. Pennsylvania, look at that, right next door to New York and New Jersey, mid-market employers in Pennsylvania are much more likely to be self-funded, 55% versus 29% in New York. I mean, it's almost double in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania tends to have lower margin businesses, especially Western Pennsylvania and Central Pennsylvania. They have a fair amount of manufacturing there. Okay, look at this. Indiana, 67%. What do you have in Indiana? Oh, Ohio, 56%. What do you have in Indiana and Ohio? It is filled, filled with tier one auto parts manufacturers. In fact, Ohio has the second highest level of auto manufacturers outside of Michigan. So you have a ton of of manufacturers in Indiana and Ohio with associated manufacturers that tend to have lower margins because they have to compete with you know, offshore, you know, China, Latin America um, manufacturing. So they've got to keep their cost structure low. And that's why they've been more aggressive in, in um, being self-funded in the mid-market. Look at this, Iowa, 58% self-funded. Again, manufacturing in Iowa as well. Georgia, 59% gobs of manufacturing in Georgia. North Carolina, 61%. South Carolina, 61%. Gobs of manufacturing in South Carolina. And it's not just manufacturing. There are other lower margin businesses that are also located in these rural states as well. And of course, let's look at other just highly populated states. So in Texas, it's at 44%. Okay, so it's a little above the national average. All right. And then if you look at other places like Illinois, Illinois is just a little below the national average, right? Because Illinois is a mix, right? Because you've got Chicago that has a lot of, of finance and law firms, some technology software companies. So you have high margin businesses in Chicago that are probably less likely to be self-funded in the mid-market. But then you do have manufacturing downstate, whether it be, you know, Caterpillar and Peoria, but you've got a lot of sort of mid-sized manufacturers downstate in Illinois as well. So it's a mix in Illinois. All right. So, and then, yes, um, thank you for your comments here, by the way. So Michael's saying Nebraska at 79%. I think that's the highest in the country. Now I will say that Nebraska is probably a little bit of an outlier just because it's a very low population state. So you can see how, if you just happen to have uh, a certain uh, number of, you know, because the vast majority of the, of the companies in Nebraska are in Lincoln and Omaha, right? So it's highly concentrated in those two places. I would add too, that there's also a social proof dynamic. There's a herd mentality of employers. I mean, it's monkey see, monkey do. We all do this and businesses do this as well. CEOs talk to each other, CFOs talk to each other, heads of HR talk to each other. And who do they talk to? They talk to people in like around them and they'll be like, hey, you self-funded? If you're in Massachusetts, no, 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 I'm not self-funded. But if you're in Nebraska, you self-funded? You have 250 employees, you self-funded? Oh yeah, I'm totally self-funded, okay? So there is that um, herd mentality, uh, social proof as well. Okay, next, okay, next. Uh, so you guys are putting in great questions. Okay, so Eric uh, is saying, why is Florida so low in the mid-market? Okay, great question. Uh, Florida, one, you know, very little to almost no manufacturing, right? So do they really have low margin businesses or high margin businesses in Florida? And also, too, I would add that especially for mid-market businesses at the state level, really the 800-pound gorilla from an insurance carrier perspective are the blues plans. It's the state-level Blue Cross plans. And so Florida Blue is a very 
very dominant blues plan in Florida. So there might be things that Florida Blue is doing to particularly encourage being fully insured and particularly discouraging being self-funded. And let's get into the specific financials of why being fully insured is so much more profitable for health insurance companies. So according to the Kaiser Family Foundation, health insurance carriers' gross margins on their, on their fully insured customers is $1,378 per employee per year. So about $1,400 per year is the gross margin uh, for a health insurance carrier. All right. So calculate how many employees are on a group plan, whether you're an employer or a broker, that's how much the carrier is making off of you. Now, I'll add one thing, the gross margins for Medicare Advantage literally double that, okay? So it's like literally $2,800 per member per year vis-a-vis -vis what it is for commercial insurance. So you think the employers are making a lot off of fully, or the uh, carriers are making a lot off of fully insured gross margins. They're making even more off of Medicare Advantage. So just know that we're talking about employer stuff, but it's still to this day, the cash cow for health insurance carriers is Medicare Advantage from a gross margin perspective. Okay, now let's look at the gross margins if you're self-funded. So here it's a little complicated and I had to cobble together information from, believe it or not, um, so some of this is from, um, what's great is that a lot of municipalities and governments are required to post things online. So you can actually find a lot of government RFPs and contracts with health insurance carriers for their self-funded plans online because they have to post them and you can get into the weeds. I listed one particular here for the city of Charleston, South Carolina, but you can see it for other cities as well. And so through my conversations with uh, self-funded employers and brokers and folks on the risk side, like in captives and stop loss carriers, in my conversations with them, I've kind of cobbled together what I estimate to be the gross margins on the self-funded side. So it's a combination of the actual ASO or TPA services itself, where the gross margin would be $48 PEPY, plus the gross margin for the PBM. Okay, so just know that the you know through the fees and the rebates that they keep etc look at the gross margins on the PBM vis-a-vis -vis just that just uh administering the claims and doing customer service and case management etc et look at that it's 10 times as much i know for a fact that there was a large midwest municipality who their um their um blues plan offered to give them aso services for free if the carrier could keep all of the PBM rebates. There is so much money in the PBM that they were willing to give away all their other services for free just so that they could keep the PBM money. That's how much money is in there. Okay. And then the stop loss as well. And so the stop loss might not be with the carrier. They might have it out with Tokyo Marine or Sun Life or whatever, but let's just say for the sake of argument that it is with uh, the carrier providing ASO services. So if you add up the 48 plus the 480 plus the 36, then you're talking a gross margin of $564. Whoa. Like even if I'm way off on this self-funding thing, like you can see how insurance carriers make a lot less money per employee off a self-funded group vis-a-vis -vis a fully insured group. And then what does that mean for the broker consultants? The higher broker consultant commissions for fully insured groups. If the insurance carrier can make this much profit off of a fully insured group versus this much less off a self-funded group, they're going to financially incentivize the brokers and consultants with much better commissions and override payments for being fully insured versus self-funded. And so this is a quote from a Dallas insurance broker who told me this about shoot, almost 10 years ago, the dirty secret in our industry, meaning the insurance broker industry, is that you make more off of a fully insured group of 100 than a self-funded group of 1,000, okay? So it is um, incredibly lucrative to be a broker for fully insured groups and not take them self-funded. Now, I'm not saying that all brokers are like that. So many of you saw my insurance broker guard dog versus carrier lap dog video. And there are many employer guard dog brokers who are aggressively moving there. In fact, I know a broker in the Washington, D.C. area who is a huge group of business. He's a young guy. I mean, he's in his late 30s. Maybe he's 40 years old. And he's grown his book of business by being by going out to employers in the Washington, D.C. area and taking himself funded. 
And they're like, oh, no one ever proposed this to me before. And so just know that there are obviously many successful brokers who are really growing large books of business by taking their um, employer, by taking employer clients uh, self-funded and winning the business away from other brokers who are keeping them fully insured. Okay. Now let's talk about the financial advantages of being self-funded. Okay. So it's going to vary by employer, but you're going to lower your overall healthcare spend by about 15% just in making the switch. And it really comes from one, the ability to use a carve out pass through PBM instead of the traditional big three PBMs. And then you're also taking money out of that carrier margin, right? So some of that money that is being spent uh, that you're paying essentially for margin here, you know, what are you talking about here? About $800. So you're essentially keeping a lot of that $800 that used to be going to the carrier in margin per employee per year. Okay. And then, but of course there are cons to being self-funded that even with specific and aggregate uh, stop loss coverage, there still will be fluctuations in your plan expenses. So everybody needs to understand that going in eyes wide open. Now, of course, uh, brokers that are trying to encourage their employers to to stay fully insured and not go self funding, they're going to massively inflate the con and massively decrease the pro. Okay, and then likewise, um, uh, brokers that are going to want to move employers to being self funded are going to emphasize the pro and de-emphasize the con. But that's where the case studies come in. I'm going to show you case studies from employers of very different mid market sizes and very different industries who have all been able to. Um, uh, deal with their fluctuating uh, claims expense uh, highly successfully. All right. Now, for um, the medical, the the medic, there are tremendous medical advantages to being self funded. So this gives you the keys to the castle, which is your data on your plan. You but you get lots of fully insured reports. It is not nearly the type of information that you actually need to be intelligent about managing risk within your population. Being self-funded gives you the data to uh, adequately manage the risk within your population by identifying what your clinical risk is and then doing something about it. Being self-funded gives you the data to identify what your clinical risk is and doing something about it. For musculoskeletal, it's putting in second opinion programs, doing direct contracting, putting in primary care. For cancer, it is putting second opinion programs, direct contracting, and primary care. For metabolic, for uh, cardiovascular disease, it's putting in metabolic syndrome programs and primary care. It's lots of other unique custom ideas by employer, but it's very important to get your data so that your solution is customized to you. Now, Let's go through some specific examples. So one, and these are all true stories. These are actual companies. I won't tell you the names of the companies, but I know the names of all these companies and I have worked with them. Okay, one, a construction company with 230 employees, understandably so, it's a largely male employee base. They had a large Spanish-speaking population across their employee base. They were self-funded prior to the Great Recession of 2008-2009 with an independent TPA. And of course, construction went way down during the Great Recession. So they had a drop in revenue and they had to lay off a lot of employers. But even with a major fluctuation in top line revenue, they were able to stay self-funded through a reduction in force and a reduction in revenue. And then, of course, you know, huge uh, increase in construction after the Great Recession. They came back, they hired more employees, they stayed self-funded the whole time. So they managed a huge economic dip all while remaining self-funded. Number two. Property management company. Notice 125 employees. It's not a big company. Okay. Largely female employee base, office, white collar, self funded with a T, and again, independent TPA, not using carrier ASO. They, because they had uh, a, a lot of uh, women in their population, they really used their data to focus on prenatal maternity. And they knew they had very busy moms working at their company. They put in telemedicine 15 years ago. And so they had the flexibility with being self-funded and looking at their data and being responsive to their employee population. I would argue that this group with telemedicine 15 years ago, they saved 
gobs of time and they improved the health of their female employees, all their employees, dramatically by their by being self-funded and being um, smart about using their data to put in specific clinical programs. Okay, next up, a custom door manufacturer and installer. Look at this, 75 employees, sub 100 employees. Again, largely male employee base. You know, they sort of had the small factory floor where they would do like the milling on the wood doors and the, uh, and the they did metal doors as well. Um, and then they would take put them in the trucks and they'd take them out to the, the site, whether it be uh, a home or, uh, or commercial or putting in these fancy doors. And again, they didn't pay their employees a lot of money. Um, they were self-funded and they clicked on the wrong button there, used the independent TPA. They put in a HSA plan uh, plus navigation tools. They were a Compass customer. They did that 13 years ago. They were very early on with uh, the HSA um, model and with self-funding at a very small number of employees. And again, they weathered the Great Recession. Great. They did uh, just fine. And they are a much larger organization today than they were at the time. So now I got to show you the flip side of the story as well. So here was a security surveillance company with 800 employees that was fully insured. Okay, so here's the complete opposite end of the spectrum where, and I was literally in the meetings with the broker and the CFO. I've witnessed this with my own eyes. And the broker was trying to convince the CFO to go self-funded. He's like, look, you're, you're kind of outside of your peer group here. Most other companies, your size, they're self-funded and here's why, and here's how we do it. And here's how we mitigate the risk. And the CFO still refused because he wanted the predictability of the known monthly premium because he knew what his employee count was and his employees on the plan. And so he knew exactly. And the broker was like, you're throwing away money by doing that. And the CFO was like, that's okay. I understand. So at least he went in eyes wide open that that's, that was, he was essentially paying more money than he needed to for the sake of predictability. And for him and his business, that was particularly important. Okay. Now there are so many things about um, stop loss insurance and being self-funded that I have not covered today, that a fantastic resource for this is a gentleman by the name of Spencer Smith on YouTube. Yes, you can actually watch educational videos about self-funding and stop loss insurance. You can learn about lasering. You can learn about attachment points. You can uh, learn about IBNR. You can know so much about being self-funded. Just go to the at self-funded um, YouTube channel, or you could just uh, on the YouTube search, type in Spencer Smith, uh, stop loss. And I guarantee he has a specific playlist. There's, if you want a copy of these slides, I'd be happy to send them to you. Just email me. And that that's the actual URL link to the playlist. It's like 30 videos. They're not long. They're like five or 10 minutes each. That does step-by-step -step guide to educate you about uh, being self-insured. Okay. So what are the take-home points? Self-funding in employers, 100 to 1,000, fantastic opportunity. Two, variable geographic utilization means variable opportunity. There's a lot of social proof for areas that have high degrees of self-funding. And frankly, if you're going to go to places like Massachusetts and California, you're just going to have to go to either one, employers that have a specific pain point, or two, early adopter employers, uh, because it's just not as prevalent in those locations. Okay, three. Better financial and medical performance, lower employee out-of-pocket costs over time. I would argue that being self-funded because it keeps costs down and then it keeps the employee out-of-pocket costs down and it keeps the employee premium costs down actually is better for healthcare access for employees. As a doctor, that is why I care about this because you can improve access to healthcare that people need. Self-funded employers give their, not all of them, but a lot of them give their employees primary care for free. A lot of self-funded employers actually pay for the dependence on the plan because they can afford to do so. From a health, from a medical perspective, that's awesome. If I could get more employers to be self-funded so that they could do that, that would be a huge public health win for me and for you. And then lastly, there, you can have success in a variety of industries and a variety of group sizes. 
And so with that, we are approaching the end of the half hour. So thank you so much for all of your questions that you've put on here. I will answer the rest that I haven't addressed here uh, in writing afterwards. Again, please connect with me on LinkedIn if you'd like to. That way you'll get my videos on your feed. Um, you can email me to join my A Healthcare Z email list along with 3,700 other folks. You can also email me for a copy of today's slides. I'd be happy to give you to the, those to you as well. And with that, I just want to wish you a happy Friday and have a fantastic weekend. Bye, everybody.